So it's going to be in this room, but you're going to enter from the level above, so on the terrace level. Um, starts at 9. Uh, there will be uh, a wide variety of beverages. Uh, some of them will require drink tickets. You'll get those when you uh, show up. So again, 9 o'clock. Have a good time. Um, I have a couple of giveaways here. Uh, can anybody tell me uh, what CBE stands for? He had his hand up, and I could hear him, and yes! At least I threw it, and it made it there. Um, and then uh, question number two for a deck of cards. Uh, what was the very first uh, CVE this year uh, for? What programming language was it against? It was PHP. I'm not throwing these. So back to the taping and streaming team, are we ready? And of course, I can't see my time, so we actually have a whole minute. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? I don't have one. Um, what? No. What's that? Um, only if they take them from other people. So, all right, um, taping and streaming, you guys ready? Excellent. So uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, her name is Sandra Iskander O'Keefe, and she'll be talking about uh, skill building uh, by revisiting uh, past CVEs. Please give her a warm shmukan welcome. Thank you, everybody. This is a nice uh, turnout. I love this. This is a great crowd. Um, so everybody can hear me OK? Great. Um, so as you know, I'm Sandra Eskandor O'Keefe, and I am an engineer, a security engineer at Fastly. Um, and you can reach me at uh, S3SCAND0R on Twitter. Um, I'm going to be. Um, around um, if you are looking for new opportunities, please get in touch with me. So um, I'm going to be chatting with you about skill building by revisiting past CVEs. So I'm going to start off with why we would want to do that in the first place. And then I'm going to talk about the general strategy for doing so. And then I'm going to introduce a concept called fundamental concept trees. And these are really useful for you to be able to solidify that knowledge that you're learning. And then we're going to dive deep into a specific CVE um, in the context of that general strategy that I was uh, talking about earlier with CVE 2013-5576. And then I'm going to conclude this talk. So the, the big idea here is that we need a pipeline of skilled security engineers. And this is one of the reasons why I encourage those of you um, to revisit past CVEs. And for those of you who have been in this industry for several years now, I encourage you to go out and mentor those who are just starting out. And this talk can give you a good place to start with your mentorship. Now, for those of you who are skill building, the path to uh, technical mastery can be very, very hazy. And when you look at a CVE for the first time, it's not so obvious about how that person who got that CV developed their reasoning in the first place. So what I suggest is to reproduce CV findings. Reproduction leads to a deeper understanding of the particular system that you are examining and the particular vulnerabilities that lie within that system. And most importantly, it helps you build your technical skills and the knowledge of the fundamental concepts that are behind those technical skills. So the general strategy that I'm suggesting today, I was actually inspired by this paper written by Keshev called How to Read a Paper. And in this paper, he mentions a three-pass approach to research paper reading. Now, CVE findings are essentially research findings, but they may or may not have a formal paper associated with them. 
<clears throat> so the general approach is a first pass where you want to have a high level overview of what that CVE is all about. And then you want to start thinking about how you can set up a test environment. And then in the second pass, you want to set up that test environment and then get a feel for the structure of that segment of vulnerable code. And then in the third pass, that's where you want to look at the details. So in the first pass, you want to think about the kinds of tools that you would uh, think um, were used to find that vulnerability and how you would classify that vulnerability if you were to be able to find that in production. And then you want to think about how you set up a test environment. In the second pass, you want to examine, but not in too much detail, uh, the structure surrounding the code where that vulnerability exists. So you want to perform a diff between the fixed and vulnerable code. And then you go on and set up a test environment. So in the third pass, you want to attempt to hit that vulnerability without using an existing exploit. So you could do this by manual experimentation or writing a script or some other existing tool like Tamper Data. And then you want to think about why that vulnerability exists in the first place. And then you want to go on and create something called a fundamental concepts tree, which I will be talking about in a few slides. So now, <clears throat> You want to time block yourself. So give yourself about one or two days. And if you don't, um, if you're not able to induce that vulnerability, don't feel so bad because um, these things take time to uh, be able to perform. Um, so when you are past that time block, you want to run that existing exploit. And if you, when you run that current existing exploit and it wasn't as smooth as you had hoped, you want to debug it until it runs well for you. And make notes of what you had to do to change um, that current existing exploit. And this is equivalent to when Keshav says, you should identify and challenge every assumption in every statement. So going back to the idea of uh, fundamental concept trees, I actually borrowed this idea from a really old computer game called Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri. So how many of you have ever played this game? Hands up. Oh, I love it. Um, so for those of you who have never played this game, it is uh, you are a leader of a civilization. And one of the things that you want to do is to be able to increase your technical um, capabilities by building more and more advanced uh, technology. But in order to do that, you need to build prerequisite technologies. So in the same vein, you want to th think really deeply about the kinds of fundamental concepts that you need to have as a prerequisite to understand a more complex idea like a CVE. So for example, the CVE that we're going to be looking at today, CVE 2013-5576, you need to have a general understanding of a client-server model and the OSI model and then a general idea of the file system structure that you're working with. And then know how to, uh, know what it, it looks like for an input validation vulnerability to happen. <clears throat> so fundamental concept trees allow us to reflect on what we're learning and to really see where we lack our understanding and so that we can improve. And this, of course, when you go on and help other people, these fundamental concept trees can help you describe what's going on. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce CVE 2013-5576, and we're going to um, look at this in the light of that general strategy that I was talking about earlier. So this is a bug that was reported to Joomla by Verisafe, and it is a Joomla Media Manager uh, component vulnerability. And it um, is a vulnerability that uh, causes f file, arbitrary file uploads. And this can result in arbitrary code execution. So after the first pass, what did I do? I created a test environment, and I performed a diff between the vulnerable code and the fixed code. And then I performed a manual test for that vulnerability without the original exploit. 
And then I examined what makes that code vulnerable in the first place. And then after that, I examined the original exploit in more detail. <clears throat> so here is my uh, test environment detail. So I used um, Linux for this. And I followed uh, basic um, installation instructions for Joomla. Now, to give you a little bit of a background, um, the Joomla Media Manager component um, allows for file uploads, but there's a gatekeeper functionality that basically has a key condition. And if the two parts of that key condition is true, then the file upload is not allowed. So the, in, in actual words, if the file name extension of the file that you're trying to upload is not in the set of allowable file name extensions and the file name extension is not in the set of ignorable file name extensions, then don't allow that upload. So if you look at my diff here between the vulnerable code and the fixed code, you can see that the variable format, um, which is a representation of the file name extension, um, is added here as an extra check. So if the variable is empty or it stores false, then don't allow that file upload. So my manual testing, I used a Tamper Data, uh, which is a browser plugin, and I modified the file name that is getting passed from the browser to the vulnerable server by experimentation. And I based this on file name strings that I've seen before that have caused issues, so permutations with star, dot, star, dot, star, et cetera. And then I watched the response behavior. So as you can see here, this is my um, post data. And I found that when I appended a dot star uh, to the file name, that was when I was able to induce that vulnerability. So why does this vulnerability occur in the first place? We know that the variable called format is problematic, and the variable format is the variable that stores the file name extension. So now let's take a look at how that variable is generated. Now, if we look, format stores the result of get ext. And if you look at this internal Joomla function, what get ext does is it uses uh, two PHP um, standard string functions, str r, pause, and substr. And effectively, what it does is it says, hey, I'm going to look at the end of this, starting from the end of the string, I'm going to move leftward and find my first occurrence of that period, and then increment by one. And that is the starting position that I want to extract my file name extension. And that's what substr does. So what I initially assumed was that when I tampered my post data in get ext, what it would see is shell.php.star. So that, because of this assumption, I assumed that substr would give back that star, because starting from the right, it moves to the left until it gets to position nine, which has that dot, and then it increases by one to the 10th position with asterisk. But in reality, there is a file name cleanup functionality that occurs before get ext sees the file name string. And I'm gonna get into uh, later a little bit how that file name cleanup functionality works. But for now, uh, in getext, it sees shell.php dot instead of shell.php dot star. So here, it goes starting to the right, moves left, and increments by one. So it gets up to one more than the length of the string. Now, if you look at the C code that um, uh, for substr, there is a condition in there that says if the length of the string is smaller than the starting position given, 
then it must return false. And in this case, that condition is met. So here, return false. Now get x returns false, and then it, uh, false gets fed into str two lower, and then that gets converted to an empty string. So file name extension is an empty string. Now, let's look at how the allowable array gets generated. So this is the set of file name extensions that are allowed to pass through and be uploaded. So in the default installation of Joomla, um, there is a string that's delimited with a comma that it represents the file names or file name extensions that are allowed. So when an array is generated from this, um, the variable format, which is empty right now, is not in that set. So that's okay. The first half of that key condition is okay. But then, when we look at the array called ignored, uh, which is an array of extensions to let pass through, if you look at the default installation of Joomla, um, there is um, an empty string that is used um, to generate this array. And because of that empty string, an array is generated where it's only one element whose value is an empty string. Therefore, in, in this particular um, case where format is an empty string, that means that, that uh, it's found in that set of ignorable extensions. So that means the second half of that key condition is false. So this means that that file upload is allowed to happen. So going back to the file name cleanup uh, functionality that I mentioned earlier. So make safe is that file cleanup functionality. And it basically filters out um, any two or more consecutive dots. Any character that is not alphanumeric, a dot, an underscore, a dash, or a single space. And any single dot at the beginning. So that means that shell.php.star becomes shell.php dot before it gets to the function called get x. So given the um, manual testing and my initial proof of concept, my initial proof of concept had a trailing dot star. But when I analyzed that vulnerability afterwards, it showed that this trailing star was not really necessary, and only a trailing dot is needed for exploiting this vulnerability. So the key takeaways for this particular CVE is that Linux file names are just a sequence of bytes that can't contain a null or a hex 2f, which is a forward slash. So that means that a file string called webshell.php dot is a valid file name. And the second key takeaway here is that it's worth exploring the C source code of PHP, especially for the standard string functions like substr and strr pause. And this is because we can miss a lot, especially the edge cases, by only looking at the documentation. So now I've shown um, a su suggested approach for those of you who are building your skills. And I've also introduced the idea of creating fundamental concept trees to help you and others learn. And I've also shown, in light of the general strategy, an example thought process through a particular CVE. Now, most importantly, the key takeaway here is to question your assumptions. So try this at home. There's two CVE um, follow-ups here. I'm going to post this on my GitHub page as well. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Um, so I actually, um, with the, the help of my mentor, Brian Adeloy, thank you, um, he challenged me to um, basically increase my um, 
increase the skills that I needed to um, improve with uh, particular CVs that he thought would um, be just the right level but not too easy or too hard. So it's, it's good to have that mentorship relationship. But if you're doing this by yourself, um, I would say it depends on, it depends. Um, so I guess I would say start with, if you already know a programming language, um, start by looking at that. And um, that's, I think that's where I, how I would start. Any other questions? Great, thank you. <laughs>